So, welcome everyone. Uh, very good morning to the colleagues in uh, Europe and uh, good afternoon to the colleagues in India and ASEAN continent. It's really nice uh, to welcome Professor Luis Vigio from CIS uh, Nanogun in Spain. Uh, you, you, I think, uh, know him very well, but it's a matter of uh, formality. I have to just introduce uh, him. Uh, and uh, it's really nice, again, to see Professor Albert Ford and uh, Professor Dell Atkinson and many other uh, uh, participants, uh, really nice. So, uh, Luis Fusho is an uh, Ikerask research professor, <clears throat> a leader of the nano devices group, and scientific director of the Unit of Excellence, Maria de Maiju, I hope I pronounced it correctly, at CIS, uh, CIC Nanobu. Uh, he is currently acting as an associate editor in the Journal of Material Chemistry C, published by the Royal Society of Chemistry, and is a program manager for material science for the Spanish National Research Agency. Since his PhD in 2002, he has worked at the University of Cambridge with Professor Neil Mathur, the Italian National Research Council with Dr. Alec Didiou, and the University of Leeds, UK as a university lecturer. His current research interests include organic electronics and spintronic devices, as well as advanced nanofabrics. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Other previous recognitions to his research include a junior research fellow at Olson College in Cambridge and a molecular science frontier professorship by the Institute of Chemistry of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So with this very brief introduction, I really welcome uh, Luis uh, to this talk and many, many thanks in advance uh, for accepting our invitation and taking the trouble to give this lecture. Uh, just there may be some new participants. I like to mention that during the lecture, we don't take questions. If you have any questions, kindly write in the chat window or just write the line that you have a question. At the end of the lecture, we will take all the questions. Thank you so much and looking forward to your lecture. Please. It's all yours. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much for the for the kind introduction. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I think you have been organizing a wonderful uh, set of lectures, and um, you know it, it's really a, a nice initiative in these times that that we cannot travel to be able to meet so many people online. And um, well, it's it's great that I'm you know warming up the audience for next week lectures that. Albert Fer will be giving, uh, you know, in in a week's time. So it's 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 very nice to to have this occasion as well. And um, well, uh, I, I apologize in advance if my internet is not very good. I'm I'm actually not in my office. I'm actually in the UK right now. I'm in Oxford. Uh, and you know, um, uh, I I came here with with my whole family for a visit and. But unfortunately, uh, we cannot uh, be in the department itself of you know, physics. So, so I have to, you know, my I have a private connection which is apparently not not up to standard. So I apologize in advance if the if this uh, frozen. So during the talk, I will disconnect my video, uh, but I will I will give you the the slides and and the voice at least. So uh, let me just go through um, the presentation so I can uh, show you here. All right. So I hope that you all can see the, the slides right now. Yes, uh, we can see it. Okay, so very good, thank you. So proposed is uh, spin orbit proximity effects in graphene-based heterostructures. And uh, well, basically, before I start with, with this talk, uh, I would like to introduce the place in, in where we are, which is uh, San Sebastian. So this is uh, the Bay of, of San Sebastian that many of you may know. And actually here, um, very close to the beach, is our research center which is fairly new. It has slightly more than a decade in operation. We are in the University of the Basque Country campus, although we uh, don't belong to the university itself. So uh, 
I'm coming here as a representation of the nano devices group, which is, is composed of two senior researchers. There is myself and Felix Casanova, who is this person here. And then we have two junior researchers, uh, Marco Gobi and Beatriz Garcia Martí, and a number of, of postdocs and PhD students. But uh, most of the work I will be presenting today has been done by a few people. So it has been done by Safir, who uh, it's an exceptionally good postdoc. He did his PhD in, in France, in Grenoble, in SpinTech, and uh, is now working with us and will be joining the University of Oxford in, in a few months. Uh, Pep Inglainez, who was a PhD student of Barb and Vest in Groningen, and, and now he's working with us, but coming back to, to the Netherlands with uh, uh, to delve uh, yeah, also in a few months. And, and last, Wen Jin Yang, who is not in this picture and is currently a research fellow in the University of Nottingham in the UK, who was one of the people uh, who started all this project. So I think my, it's very important for me to give credit to these people because they actually pushed their research really uh, in this topic and they were paramount in, in the publications that you're going to see. So. Uh, Basically, this slide uh, reflects a bit all the what you would like to know about the talk. So here we have a graphene layer, and we have a transition decalcogenide layer close together. And what I'm going to show along this talk is how these materials work together to have better properties, to have better spintronic properties. So uh, rather than having one material itself and trying to tune its composition, I'm going to show you how heterostructures of different materials can have very interesting spintronic properties and uh, be useful probably for applications. So the outline of the talk, uh, we will have first uh, the introduction and then I will talk about the spin hole effect and how different combinations of even material with graphene uh, show different opportunities and different effects on, on the spin hole front. And then I will talk about the spin hole effect, but not uh, on a combination of materials, but how a given material transmits its properties into graphene, what we call proximitized graphene, how the, the graphene changes because of the proximity effect with another material. And these two parts of the talk are the main results of the talk that I will be showing. So let me start with this image. So this is a, a graph that our colleagues from Intel uh, send us. So we have a group of Albert in Senegal is, is involved. Uh, and uh, another partners in the US. And here uh, you can see basically uh, a graph of the energy required versus the delay to perform a certain like operations. In this case, it's a 32 bit uh, logic unit. And as you would go in the fabrication, and we go from, you know, uh, 34. 350 nanometers to more uh, competing nodes right now, like 14 nanometers, the energy is reduced, but so is the delay. So we are moving in the right direction. Eventually we would like to be in this corner where we have less energy and less delay for each logic operation that we perform. But the main issue is that we can plot this in a different way. So here, if we plot the power density versus the throughput, which is another measure of the logic operations, we see how we're moving in the opposite direction. We have a larger power density for a larger throughput indeed, but the problem is that we eventually will like to be flat or going down, but we have a bigger and bigger power density and this is one of the main limitations of current computing, since we have more and more energy needed in the same space. And that prones problems for energy dissipation and for the reliability of many of the devices. So here is where Spintronics uh, appear. 
And in spintronics, we, we, of course, we use the spins to transport and to process information. We, but eventually we will like two big objectives. One is the integration of memory and logic in the same uh, node, and then to have low power operation at reduced scale. And particularly the integration of memory and logic is really important because right now in the current computing uh, strategies, in the current computing topologies, uh, memory and logic are separated. And hence our, our computers need to send all the logic information to the memory and back. And that's a precious time that is wasted. If we could eventually integrate everything, hopefully in a non-volatile way using uh, magnetic materials, for instance, the operations would be much faster and hopefully need less energy for being realized. And in this line, there have been a number of, of proposals in the market. So for instance, we have this spin-based magnetologic that uh, our colleague Hanan Derry proposed uh, already more than one decade ago with, with Lushan. Also, we have this proposal with uh, all spin logic, which are basically uh, using magnetic tunnel junctions here, for instance, and how these magnetic tunnel junctions move the information from one to the other through a, a graphene or a semiconducting material. And then we have multiple logic cascaded. But this, I'm afraid, or both the spin-based magnetologic and the spin logic are a theoretical proposals mostly. But I would like to mention also the newer spin orbit magnetoelectric logic that was proposed by Intel and others. Uh, quite recently. And here is a kind of different approach because we don't rely so much on uh, a spin transport, but we rely on, on one hand on a, a you know, magnetic material, magnetoelectric material that is capable here of detecting and storing the information and on a spin uh, hole effect that converts a spin to charge information in our logic device. And uh, if you allow me, this is very promising because indeed if we put now all these spintronic proposals into several uh, other uh, alternatives in the same energy versus delay graph that I showed you before, you can see how these are very competitive. And for instance, the misologic that I show you has lower energy operation than any of the other alternatives. And here we are talking other uh, scientific proposals because the, for instance, the CMOS low voltage, the current CMOS low voltage is in green here, while the CMOS high power is uh, here, much higher energy, of course, although smaller delay. So the misologic that, uh, I just mentioned could be quite nice in terms of the energy consumption, even if it's not the uh, fastest uh, alternative right now, but it could be very convenient for, for many applications. So all these uh, alternatives are relying on the spin hole effect. And the spin hole effect is basically a, an intrinsic effect that appears everything every, in every material, but most notably on strong spin orbit coupling materials because it relies on the spin orbit coupling of, of a given material. And just very briefly, I mean, this is a, a series of spintronics, so I understand many of you know about this. So we have the direct effect, the spin hole effect direct. So if we have a material with this uh, axis, and if we have a charged current, which is unpolarized, okay, so it has, Spin ups and spin downs, is in the material is going to create an independent scattering, and spin ups and spin downs are going to appear at the different edges of the sample. Accordingly, we're going to have a gradient on the concentration of the spins, which creates a diffusive spin current, which here is represented as IS. And notice that we always have this rule between IS, IC, and the spin. So 
spin current, charge current, and the spin orientation. And in this case, for instance, we have spins in the set direction. The current, the charge current is on the y direction. And hence we have the spin current in the x direction. We always have this cross product that you see here. The spin current is the cross product of the charge current by the spin orientation. And we have the spin hole effect, uh, the spin hole angle here as the parameter that tell us what is the proportionality between the charge current that we inject and the spin current that we obtain. We have, of course, the opposite uh, geometries. If we have spins now in this direction, in the x direction, the deflection will be in the z direction and the spin current will be in the x, in the z direction. So uh, I'm just mentioning this because these are the different geometries I will show later on in the actual experiment. So uh, please try to keep that in mind, but I will, I will exemplify them later on. So this is about the spin current generation. We have a charge current, and thanks to the spin hole effect, we can create a spin current. But we, of course, have the inverse spin hole effect in which through a spin current, we have a charge current. And in this case, we have, of course, the opposite effect. We have here a spin current. And through the effect, we have now a charge current in this direction with the same uh, geometry that I showed you in a, a minute ago. And this is really important because we can detect the spin current. And from a net spin imbalance, we can obtain a voltage out, a current and, a, and hence a voltage. And uh, the spin hole effect is really paramount for spintronics because at the end of the day, spintronics is, is really nice. But let's not forget that what we need to measure eventually in our electronic equipment is a voltage. So we need to be able to get all that spin information that we are playing with, transform it into a voltage that we are able to read and to use into our devices. So once at that, of course, the spin hole effect is extremely important for a number of, of very basic uh, physical effects in spintronics. Just to mention a few, we have, for instance, the spin feedback effect or a spin pumping in which the magnetization uh, is trans transformed by the you know, imbalance at ferromagnetic frequencies, or a spin hole magnet resistance. All these three effects, for instance, rely one way or the other on the spin hole. But Hello, Luis. Can you hear me? Uh, we cannot hear you. Hello, Luis. Um, can anybody say? I mean, I'm not able to hear Luis. Anybody other can hear him? I can hear you, uh, Shibanka, but I can't hear Louise. Oh, okay. So the same problem here. But, uh, okay. Um, Louise, uh, if you... I 
think I'm sorry for this inconvenience. I think he has some internet issues. Let's see if it will be resolved. So, to me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, I'm very, I'm very sorry. Uh, again, apologies for for this issue. Uh, yeah. Smart so you. I'll I'll try I'll try to go back. Uh, thanks, Albert, for for phoning me. Uh, I'll, I'll try to go back to the um, to the slides. Um, yes. So, uh, did Please you share hear? Sorry. Please share your screen. We don't see your yes. PPT. Okay, we see. Okay. Could you kindly okay. go back uh, to like one slide back, I guess? Uh, okay, this one? This slide you can explain. It was, voice was not very clearly audible here. So you may kindly start from here. Okay, so uh, apologies again for the for this problem. Um, so basically we have the, uh, um, the spin hole effect, which I mentioned that is very important for spin current generation. And uh, also, uh, sorry. And also the uh, inverse spin hole effect, which is very important for the spin current detection. And what I was mentioning is that uh, it's really important here because you can have uh, a spin current and, and you can manipulate the spin currents, you can do many things with them. But it's crucial that that spin current, eventually you can convert it into a voltage with, that powers your electronic devices. Because uh, important as spins may be, eventually we need uh, the electronic devices to operate with a voltage. And I was mentioning that the uh, spin hole effect is really uh, interesting for many fundamental applications such as the spin Seebeck effect, spin pumping, or spin hole magneto resistance, which relies all of them on the spin hole effect. But there, there is also uh, the underlying mechanism on applied very important uh, features such as the spin orbit torques, for instance, which are fundamental uh, you know, for, for new memory devices, spin to, uh, torque memories in which the magnetization uh, is changed by the current flowing in a strong spin orbit coupling material, or the spin orbit logic, uh, I will briefly uh, explain a bit more in detail. So for this spin orbit logic, which is called MISO, magnetoelectric spin orbit logic, we have the, uh, the writing of the logic is done by a magnetoelectric material here, for instance, bismuth ferrite. And that magnetoelectric material changes the magnetization okay, of a magnetic element here, for instance, a cobalt uh, bead. That is very nice, but there we can write this memory. But for reading it, the important thing happens here, and is that we can read it through the spin hole effect created by the orientation of this magnetic bit. So we have the reading here and by a spin hole effect. And eventually for applications, we may need a voltage output of around 100 millivolts. And this is important because all the logic needs to be cascaded. We cannot have only one uh, node, we have, we need this uh, bit somehow to power the subsequent bits in the logic. This is an image of one of the actual devices that, that we did in our lab. 
So we have, uh, this is only the reading part of the mesologic. So we have the here, the cobalt iron uh, bead. And here we have the platinum, which is the strong spin orbit coupling material. And we can detect by the inverse spin hole effect through the platinum, the magnetization of the cobalt. So here you can see actual data at room temperature. So tuning the magnetization of the cobalt with a magnetic field, we have two different distinctive voltages in the voltage created by the inverse spin hole effect. So we can read the information of the magnetic bit, but the uh, spin hole effect. And I must say that now we have a full device in which we write with a bismuth ferrite and we read with the platinum operative in our, in our lab. So it's a very nice progress into this project. The main issue, as you can see here, is that uh, the voltage output is required to be 100 millivolts, but uh, the uh, actual output that we have is much more reduced. So, all these outputs, uh, all this uh, extra output that we have, uh, it's proportional to this uh, fairly complicated equation, but that if we uh, explore it, it's quite simple because many of these are, are geometrical factors like thicknesses or uh, widths or resistivities of the different materials. But there is an important point that here, we must highlight. And to maximize the output of the resistance that we read, we need a material that has the maximum spin hole angle. So the maximum spin charge to voltage or spin charge to current charge conversion, but also the maximum uh, spin relaxation length. Both of these multiply is the figure of merit of the material that we are looking for. And it's important that we maximize this for creating the maximum output. So what's the main issue here? That, well, ideally, we would like a material with weak spin orbit coupling because that would lead to long distance spin transport. So we have maximum lambda. But on the other hand, we want a strong spin orbit coupling because that leads to a large spin hole effect and obviously to the maximum uh, theta. But these are mutually exclusive properties in one material. It's difficult to have a sweet spot in which we have a weak spin orbit coupling and a strong spin orbit coupling. And indeed, a prototypical heavy metal such as platinum has this product in the order of 0.2 to 0.4 nanometers only. So the, the question here is how we can explore and maximize materials with the best output. So uh, here is where 2D materials appear because they open new possibilities and new uh, uh, strategies for creating a much better response than conventional materials. And this is basically because we have a huge variety of materials that allow us to have, for instance, tunnel barriers, materials with weak spin orbit coupling, such as graphene, transition metal decalcogenized with a strong spin orbit coupling, such as molybdenum ditelluride, even surface states of topological insulators could be explored. And something that Albert will talk uh, next week would be 2D magnets, uh, which are also very promising on how to create a uh, magnetism in, in 2D and how to manipulate it. So there are multiple possibilities here. And the obvious choice, of course, is to start with graphene, which offers us a weak spin orbit coupling platform in which spins can travel for long distances. And here is uh, one of the images of uh, a graphene spin valve in which we have you know, graphene with different cobalt electrodes. And I believe this is from one of the papers of the Barb and Bess, but there are many others afterwards, uh, some from Paris and other, and other groups that show the potentiality of the uh, long distance spin transport in graphene. And of course, again, has long distance spin transport, so we have a nice lambda of 
from 2 to 30 nanometers, depending on the, on the conductivity of the graphene, but also weak spin orbit coupling. And there have been a number of proposals to increase the spin orbit coupling in graphene. The first one is to combine it with a strong spin orbit material, such as a heavy metal or a 2D material, in a kind of van der Waals heterostructures that have become very popular as a way of creating materials by piling them up artificially. But the option too is to enhance the spin orbit coupling in graphene for instance, by hydrogenation or atomic decoration or even spin orbit proximity. And I will show you these two options in the uh, two sections of the talk in the next few minutes. So let me just recap briefly. What we need is to improve this figure of merit, which is the uh, lambda by theta. So the spin hole angle multiplied by the spin diffusion length. And our strategy here is to use 2D materials to make it as efficient as possible. So in the first part, uh, I'm gonna show you the results of these publications, mostly by Wen Jin Yang, as I mentioned now in Nottingham and, and Safir, who will be going to Oxford uh, very, very soon. And these are the people who I have to credit for most of the, of the work performed here. And uh, in the first place, I would like to show you a very simple experiment. Because if what we want is to merge a material with long spin orbit coupling, sorry, long spin diffusion length, we can choose graphene. And for a strong spin orbit coupling, we can choose platinum. And hence, this is the easiest and most obvious alternative to create a device. So uh, you can see here the uh, uh, color code image of the actual device. So we can see here the graphene layer. Here we have in red cobalt electrodes that are uh, the responsible of injecting spin polarized carriers into the graphene. And in blue, we have the platinum in which we perform the spin charge conversion. So if we zoom in here, the cartoon would be that we have a spin injection by the cobalt. The cobalt hands inject the spins into the graphene. And we have a non-local geometry. So we have a purely diffusive current into the graphene. These spins reach the platinum that is here. Then they go into the Z direction as a spin charge current, they are injected into the platinum in the set direction. And hence, following the rule that I mentioned before, we should have uh, uh, no voltage into this geometry. So how do we do it? Well, if we now get the magnetic field for the magnetization of the cobalt in this direction, now we have the spins in the X direction, the spin current is in the set direction, and we will have easily a voltage that we can record in the y direction. And indeed, these are the actual experiments. When we have the magnetization of the cobalt in the positive x direction, we have a voltage, which we call here resistance because we divide by the current. And when we rotate the magnetization of the cobalt, then we have the opposite voltage. So this is a direct measurement of the spin hole effect in platinum with the spins having been injected from a graphene electrode. You can see that when we do the opposite rotation, we have exactly the same curve. So we don't have any hysteresis, any spurious effect here. So it's a very nice measurement. And since we are using diffusive current, we have no artifacts that obscure our response. And how this performs? Well, actually very good. So if we plot here the uh, resistance, this value, the delta of resistance created by the spin to charge conversion of the graphene platinum geometry, you can see here that the values are much, much higher than in any other fully metallic system. And we close here values such as 
cobalt platinum or cobalt, uh, cobalt iridium, uh, copper niobium, etc. There are many other references, and they are actually all down here. You need to zoom in to see them all, and they are on the value of 0.1, while we are at room temperature of around 10 milliohms. And this is really nice, and it's all created by a very nice somehow trick. And the trick being that the spins flow in the graphene, get into the platinum, but since the spin resistance of the graphene is very large, because it's just a two-dimensional conductor with a very large sheet resistance, these spins don't want to get back to the graphene at all, as would happen with the copper. They don't want to get back into the graphene, and then they are all inside the platinum and converted very efficiently into a voltage. So this is a very promising effect of how very simple combination of, of structures can work. So you can see here, for instance, the values of 0.5 nanometers, in this case for platinum, at room temperature, which is really promising. But as I uh, have uh, explained, this is a very, very simple experiment. It's just a platinum deposited on graphene. And now we would like to go to a more complicated structure. So we do a, a Van der Waals heterostructure in this case, and we replace platinum by molybdenum ditelluride. Molybdenum, so you can see here the device. This is the graphene layer that you can barely see here in the middle. All these are cobalt contacts that inject the spin polarized carriers into the graphene. And here we have the molybdenum ditelluride in which we can see the spin charge conversion that happens here. And why molybdenum ditelluride? Well, basically because it's a semi-metal, so you know, we can contact it nicely. It has a very strong spin orbit coupling, but it also has low symmetry. And this is interesting because uh, it's a material with a large spin orbit coupling, but with long lambda predicted theoretically. And it has, due to the low symmetry, the possibility of unconventional spin hole effect. So all these rules that I mentioned of the spin hole effect symmetry are mediated by the crystal symmetry. So if your material has a three mirror symmetry, such as platinum, then you have the rules that I explained, the screwdriver rules. But when you go to a material such as molybdenum ditelluride, that has only one mirror symmetry, there could be other components of the spin hole effect. So basically the spin charge conversion, this spin hole effect is, is, is a matrix, right? It's a tensor that in the three mirror symmetry only has diagonal terms. But when you reduce the symmetry of your system of diagonal terms start to appear and suddenly you could have contributions of the spin hole effect in the same direction of the spin current or in the same direction of the charge current, for instance. And this is something that was explored in tungsten ditelluride, which is a similar system to molybdenum ditelluride as the one we are studying here. So let me show you the experiment. So here we have the same problem we had before. We have, if we have injection, the normal injection with the cobalt magnetization along the easy axis of the electrode, we have the spins flowing in the y direction, and we shouldn't have any voltage because that would be symmetry forbidden. That's why we saw in the platinum uh, case. So that's why we need to go to the spins in the, diff in the hard direction of the cobalt to have the spin charge conversion. And that's exactly what we did with the platinum and what we do here. This is the experiment, but what we see here is that we are not have the S curve that we have for the platinum simply, but we have this kind of a strange hysteresis. So there is an extra contribution that we can try to disentangle. So we can, for instance, get these curves and do a symmetric and anti-symmetric component. We see here for the symmetric component, the anti-symmetric component is the conventional spin hole effect. So this is the spin charge conversion, very conventional, the S-curve. 
but we see a symmetric component that appears extra. And this appears when we measure in the y direction. So in this configuration that we should not have, we remember, we should not have any spin charge conversion, we can measure a spin charge conversion for the case of the molybdenum ditelluride. And this is exactly created by the low lattice symmetry that we have in molybdenum ditelluride. So this is a very interesting effect because we not only have the conventional spin hole effect that we would expect in any material, we have an extra contribution in a different direction. So this could be, for instance, interesting for spin orbit torques in which you have yet another voltage in another direction that you could profit for an electronic device. So we have, again, here the conventional one, in which we have the screwdriver rule, and an unconventional one, in which in this case, the spin orientation and the charge current are both in the same direction. And this is only created by the breakdown of the symmetry of the material. So you can see here the values of the delta lambda in nanometers. And we can see how for this case, we reach more than one nanometer. So this value is more than double than for platinum, particularly at room temperature. So it's not only that we have a, an extra contribution here in green, is that the normal contribution is much stronger than in conventional materials. So these are the conclusion. In this case, we have a value of delta lambda of 1.15 nanometers at room temperature, plus an extra unconventional contribution. OK, so I have shown you here how we have a large spin charge conversion efficiency, but also a multidirectional spin to charge conversion. So in this part, I have shown you a very uh, simple effects in which we put a material on top of uh, graphene. So we have a spins traveling through graphene and the spins go into the new material and transform into a charge current that we measure with different geometries, with different efficiency, et cetera. But they are somehow simple experiments. What we actually wanted to do is to change the properties of graphene itself, to, to get something that changes itself and to have all the properties into one single tunable material. And these are the publications. Uh, again, Safir was leading most of them and Frank Hersling, with, who is a very talented student working with him, also had a very important contribution in this case. So Franz wants to be an astronaut, by the way, but you know I'm, I'm sure he will do sign, good in science. So if you want to hire him, contact me. So what are we doing in this case? In this case, the idea, as I mentioned, is like we don't want to do the spin charge conversion into a new material. We want to change graphene and created by a spin orbit proximity, a spin hole effect in the same graphene. So how do we do the experiments? Well, this, oh, sorry, this has been theoretically predicted. These are images from uh, an article from the group of Stefan Roche in, in Barcelona, in which they predicted how a, a large uh, spin hole in, in all these materials in contact with graphene, but it had not been realized experimentally. And the experiment is actually relatively easy. So we put a chunk of molybdenum disulfide in contact with graphene. And now, again, notice the different geometry. We do not measure the calcogenide. We measure the graphene, OK? So the geometry is slightly different, because now we have uh, the cobalt electrode. The cobalt inject the spins. But the spin charge conversion is done in this same material. So for, for now, uh, the right geometry to observing the spin charge conversion is that we need to put the spin orientation in the z direction. The charge current, sorry, the spin current is in the x direction. And hence, the spin charge conversion will be in the y direction. In the previous case, 
the spins were being sucked into the platinum or the molybdenum ditelluride. That's not the case here. They are always in the graphene. The molybdenum disulfide is basically an insulator in the range that we apply. So with this geometry, we apply the field in the x direction. We have a precession of the spins. And when they reach the right uh, uh, angle of precession for the right field, we will have a spin charge conversion that we can measure transversally. And this is the kind of curve that we will measure. And for the opposite magnetic field, we will see this. So this is the mental experiment that we do. This is what we would like to see. And now I'm going to show you the actual experiments. So we have here a crossbar. Here we have only graphene. This is our reference electrode. And here we have graphene with molybdenum disulfide placed on top. And this is actually the beauty of the van der Waals heterostructures that we can build by mechanical exfoliation these structures at our wish. So across the graphene, here in this layer, of course, we don't see any spin charge conversion. This is just a simple uh, whole effect of the graphene. But across the place where we have put the molybdenum disulfide, we see exactly what we have thought in our mental experiment. And when we rotate the magnetization, again, in the graphene, we just see whole effect. And across the graphene, molybdenum disulfide, this image on your bottom left, we see exactly the opposite uh, butterfly as we have predicted. So this, with this geometry, it's an unambiguous proof that we have a spin hole effect in graphene. This is not an interfacial effect. This is not effects created by Rashba in the, in the uh, molybdenum disulfide, et cetera. It's just that the molybdenum disulfide is transferring by a spin orbit proximity, some spin orbit into the graphene. And hence, graphene can transfer a spin current into a charge current. And this is a very nice experiment because we have been able to modify the properties of graphene in a van der Waals heterostructure. So you can see here, this is a normalization of the effect, removing the, the standard hole effect. We can do some fittings. And what we obtain is very nice values because we get a lambda of 300 nanometers and a theta of 4%, which is quite remarkable for a spin orbit effect. So hence, we have the combination of long spin orbit, trans long spin transport, and large spin hole effect in the same material. So what we thought it was impossible, because we have to tune compositions, etc. in this nice device, we are able to have them all together. And the product, is 13 nanometers, which is 10 times larger than the value we obtain for molybdenum ditelluride, and 25 larger, 25 times larger than the one we see for platinum. So it's extremely efficient, this conversion, because it's happening all in the same material. So can basically, can we put anything on top of graphene and induce a response? And well, maybe. So we have done it with graphene and a transition metal decalcogenide, but I'm gonna show you how we do it with bismuth oxide. And the nice thing of the bismuth oxide is that since it's an insulator, it doesn't shunt the, the spin current and it's a very standard fabrication with uh, normal deposition tools. We also chose bismuth oxide because well, it has a large spin charge conversion and also induce skew scattering in cobalt. So there are a number of ex previous experiments that told us that it could be a, a nice material to combine with graphene. So this is again the same experiment. We have the crossbars of graphene and in some of them we deposit bismuth oxide. And again, the red ones are cobalt electrodes that inject the spin polarized carrier. And we see you can see here the same loop 
that we had for the case of the molybdenum disulfide, showing that we have induced a spin orbit coupling in the graphene. In this case, I'm showing you results at room temperature. So very nice. You can see how it evolves with the different temperatures. So we have here again a new figure of merit. It's not as nice as in the case of the graphene molybdenum disulfide, is 0.4, similar to the platinum, probably because here we are inducing damages into the graphene by the deposition. And you know, the 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 van der Waals epitaxy is not present here anymore. It's more like a conventional deposition of materials. So in the case of the graphene, probably uh, the main reason is that we have a spin orbit coupling is valley Siemens spin orbit charge, uh, spin orbit coupling proximity. When we put the molybdenum disulfide on top of the graphene. In the case of the bismuth oxide, it's a bit more complicated. Probably we have a skew scattering created in the graphene layer by uh, at atoms coming from the bismuth, but this is not entirely clear to us, but there is a number of theoretical proposals, Aides Ferreira, many others, uh, who uh, explore these possibilities. But we are still working on this to try to disentangle the physics uh, behind our effect. So this was the last experiment I wanted to show you. So let me just go to the summary. In the first part of the talk, I showed you the, the spin hole effects in platinum and how we combine it with graphene. We have a large spin injection from platinum into graphene or from graphene into platinum, both work, and a large spin charge conversion signal at room temperature. In the second experiment, I showed you the spin hole effect in molybdenum ditelluride and how we have a multidirectional spin charge conversion and a large spin charge conversion efficiency. In the third experiment, uh, I talk about the spin hole effect in graphene TMDs. We have done it with molybdenum disulfide. There are extra experiments with tungsten diselenide I have not shown you today, but uh, both of them show the, the first demonstration of a spin hole effect in graphene by proximity. It's also electrically tunable. We can tune the response by an electrical gate. And it has the best spin charge conversion efficiency of all the materials I have shown you. And last, I've shown you the spin hole effect in graphene bismuth oxide and how we have uh, this uh, effect in a graphene insulator system and the possible extrinsic origin of the spin hole effect. And uh, these four uh, different experiments show the potentiality of, of all these van der Waals heterostructures for spintronics. And we are, we are of course, uh, keep on working on these, and we hope to move them forward into applications such as the uh, MISO logic that I showed you in the introduction of the talk, which rely on a large spin charge conversion efficiency. And with that, I would like just to thank you very much and apologies again for the weak internet connection and thanks very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Luis, for this excellent talk. So on behalf of my team, Dr. Rajbhusan Singh, Mr. Rusmindra Gupta, and on behalf of all the participants, I thank you. So we can take some questions. Uh, I do not see any questions right now. So I can maybe ask, just give a short uh, question. Uh, so always uh, in the evaluation of the spin hole angle. So uh, well, you didn't show the formula, but uh, in, you have probably taken the uh, theta and the lambda value, the product as one fitting parameter, the theta SH and the uh, spin diffusion length. And then you saw in terms of some nanometer uh, uh, numbers. Uh, I wonder, um, can we, uh, you know, evaluate then uh, quantitatively the spin hole angle from that number? Well, uh, in some cases, no. So the question, uh, sorry, I'm gonna stop the video again. Okay, I also stop video. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so uh, the answer is, is no. Uh, and the, the problem is that, for instance, in, in this equation, 
that that you see here, we have the product, right? So uh, this product comes together in this formula. So uh, you need an extra experiment to extract the, the spin hole angle or the spin diffusion length. So with a single experiment, you, you are not able. You, you need, uh, as I said, an, an extra one. You can do several assumptions with extra experiments that you may have, uh, and that's good. Uh, but in general, it's, it's complicated to have one with the, with the single experiment. That that's typically the main the main problem that we have here. Yeah, I mean, one way is probably to take the uh, literature value for the spin diffusion length and then you have yeah. the uh, theta. But yeah, yeah, that may be a little so, bit of uh, discrepancy. I understand. Yeah, the, the main issue that we have here is that, for instance, the value of theta uh, for uh, for a simple material such as platinum they change massively from experiment to experiment and from technique to technique. So it's important to um, you know, uh, make sure that the values that you are using are the right ones for your experiment, right? So, so it's not trivial to extract everything together. But for instance, you can do uh, you know, Hanley experiments on the graphene and extract the spin diffusion length from there and then take it to the, to the other part of the, of the geometry. This is yeah. why, for instance, uh, in this kind of devices, it's quite interesting because we have one area of the device in which we have only graphene, and we can do some experiments in graphene and extract, for instance, the mobility, etc. And other part of the device of the same graphene, but with the molybdenum disulfide. And hence, in this case, we have a uh, both materials in the same device and we minimize the error in that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are other questions, please, uh, you can also just raise a hand. Uh, well, we have some questions from uh, Pranav Muduli. Pranav, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I was just wondering about this uh, multi-directional uh, spin to charge conversion that you mentioned. Uh, so you observed that only for this heterostructure, uh, uh, did you observe also for the pure graphene, for example, have you done experiments? Uh, yes. On that? Uh, so, so we only observe it be in this kind of materials. We are, ex we, ha we are exploring uh, molytelluride. We also have some data for tungsten detelluride, which is, has also a reduced uh, geometry, uh, sorry, symmetry. And the, the main reason is that you need your lattice, your, your crystal lattice, to have low symmetry. When you have low symmetry, you have this extra of diagonal turns for the spin uh, hole angle. And there you can have the, the extra responses. So in a material such as, you know, uh, graphene or, or any other, you are not going to have that. We, we always measure it, of course. We try to measure all the possible uh, geometries with the magnetic field at different uh, angles and different directions. But uh, we never see anything. And we only see it in these specific materials that we have. they have very low symmetry. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, one more question I was uh, wondering, uh, when you have this uh, graphene channels, so yes. some of the channels looks very long, like more than 10 mic micron. Yes. So uh, they may have green boundary in it, right? Uh, well, or they have, yeah. yeah. Typically, this we do by mechanical exfoliation. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so this, uh, it comes from a single flake of graphene that we etch. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So it's, it's, so it's exfoliation, not CVD graphene, okay. No, we, we could do it, and, and actually we are doing it with CVD graphene, mm -hmm. but you know, CVD graphene has a lot of grain boundaries, um, and moreover has a lot of contamination that we don't see. It may have like, you know, uh, residues from the fabrication, residues from the removal from the copper, there are, there are many nice, not very nice things that, that create that CBD graphene typically is 
it has worse properties for spin transport. So these devices that I'm showing you here, this was a very big flake, like maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 by 30 microns that we etch into a line. So in principle, that guarantees that the quality is relatively good. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, there is a question from my former PhD student, Sijan, who are quite a bit on fullerene based intronics. Uh, so she is now a postdoc at Thales. Sijan, you want to ask your question or should I read it? Okay, maybe I will read it. Uh, so she's thanking you for a good talk. Uh, can you please uh, tell what is the spin charge conversion efficiency for graphene MOT2 at room temperature? Yeah, so this, these are actually the values in this case. So you can see that uh, we have plotted in this graph the lambda theta uh, for the two contributions. In green, you have the unconventional contribution that you have the uh, spins and the charge current in the same uh, direction. And in red, you have the conventional one. And they have a slightly different temperature dependence that honestly, we don't understand why. So we are trying to work with theoreticians to, to uh, understand the different temperature dependence, but we don't have it clearly, a clear explanation. But in the case of the conventional is 115 nanometers at room temperature. So this is uh, two to three times larger than platinum. And in the unconventional one is around 0.5 nanometers, which is slightly better than platinum at room temperature. So it's, it's really a material with uh, very good properties, particularly uh, not so much the response, which is double that platinum is three times is okay, but because of this extra contribution that you don't have in platinum or in other conventional uh, metals like tantalum or tungsten that you deposit. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, well, there is uh, some more questions. Uh, does the spin charge conversion depend on the thickness of the uh, PMDC layer by a upsa? Okay, uh, so uh, there, there may be different questions here. So for, for this particular case of the molybdenum ditelluride, we don't know. And that's the honest layer uh, answer. Uh, we used relatively thick layers above 10 nanometers. Uh, so in such a way that it's a good conductor and we have uh, low noise when we measure. We have different experiments with different thicknesses. Imagine 15, 30, 20 something. And we don't see uh, any dependence, but maybe hidden and, and we don't see it. For the case of the molybdenum disulfide, uh, this is purely proximity, and hence it does not depend on the thickness of the of the molybdenum disulfide or the tungsten diselenide that we deposit. Uh, we could deposit something thin, but there is no much point in doing it difficult. So we typically do something relatively thick that that is easier to to exfoliate. But the the actual response doesn't depend on on the thickness in this case. Okay, uh, the next question by Omidbar. Uh, I have, he has two questions. What is the usual contact resistances at the graphene contacts? Also, as you said, how do you get rid of the post lithography residue on the regist, if any? Okay, so uh, uh, regarding contact resistances, uh, the, the goal, uh, we have two different uh, kinds of, of, of contacts, right? For instance, in this case, you can see we have gold and gold is very low contact resistance, a few ohms. Uh, it's basically an ohmic contact or a very nice contact with the graphene. In the case of the cobalt, uh, I did not mention this, and, and I'm sorry for that. We have a tunnel barrier of titanium oxide below to in increase the contact resistance and improve the spin efficiency. And we have resistances of around a few kilo ohms. That seems to, to be the sweet spot uh, for, this, uh, for this case. Uh, also, how do we get rid of the post residues? Well, some, uh, sometimes we do an annealing uh, at around three to 400 degrees C. 
to uh, burn, let's say, uh, you know, PMMA or other um, lithography residues that may uh, stay on the graphene. But what is important is uh, annealing, it's also for the spin proximity, okay? Uh, and this is because spin proximity relies on, on uh, orbital contact, right? The orbitals of the graphene and the, and the molybdisulfide need to be in, in contact. And what we realize is that when we don't anneal, we may have a, a, a larger gap and the experiment doesn't work. So we need to anneal the devices and then the, 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 the layers get slightly closer and here is where we have the spin, the spin proximity. So we don't only improve the quality of uh, the graphene itself by removing residues, but we also make possible the spin orbit proximity. Okay, thank you. The next question by Ria. Uh, she has a doubt, I think she's a young student. Uh, which one is more effective in the spin only effect or ISH in platinum plus graphene? Okay, so this is actually a very, very good question. And actually it's a very good question because I didn't mention it. So here we have two effects. On one hand, we have uh, injection of spins in graphene and the inverse spin hole effect that is being done in the platinum. And we have this response, okay? This is what I showed you in this talk. This is the inverse spin hole effect. But there is another effect, of course, and is that we can put a current into the platinum and by the spin hole effect, we create a spin current into the graphene that we can detect with the cobalt, okay? And this is the reciprocal effect and the efficiency is exactly the same. So we can actually inject the spins in, in platinum and read a voltage and we can create spins in the platinum and inject them into the graphene and read them with the cobalt. It's the reciprocal effect and it's exactly the same. In both of them, we have the same with the error bar, of course, and the same efficiency. The main problem is actually uh, technical. It's relatively easy to measure the voltage in the graphene, in, sorry, in the, in the platinum, but when we try to do the opposite effect, we have to read with the cobalt and the cobalt has a tunnel barrier and hence we have a lot of noise. So the error bar is a bit larger. It's a slightly more complicated effect, but the deficiency is exactly the same. So thanks for the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one doubt. Uh, so in this kind of structure, the Rasma Edelstein effect uh, will be uh, significant or negligible? In this case, it's negligible. I mean, the, the RASPA will have a different geometry. So we measure in different orientations of the magnetic field uh, of the, well, actually of the in, injected spins. We should be able to see if we have RASPA, but we never reported. So uh, the conclusion that we reached is that in this case, or for instance, in the case of the graphene molybdenum telluride, we only have spin hole effect we would never have uh, a, a, a important Rajpa contribution at the interface. Okay. And Thank actually for, oh, the, for the case, sorry, for the case of the proximity effect in graphene, it's very tricky because one could say, well, you don't have the spin hole effect in graphene. You have only Rajpa at the interface, but the Rajpa will have again, a totally different, uh, uh, you know, geometry. So we never see the Rajva. We have done all the possible control experiments and we never see the Rajva, only the spin hole in the graphene. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, thank you for answering all the questions so nicely. So may I request you to uh, stop the sharing? I want to actually present a small token of appreciation. So this time we have started with a plaque and uh, we will also uh, uh, 
you know, present to our previous speakers uh, by email. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm very pleased to present this plaque. W2S seminar, webinar series on skin tronics, nicer wounds of India. Next pleasure in presenting the plaque to Professor Luis E. Russo from CIS Nanogun San Sebastian in Spain. In the cognition and appreciation for me, a valuable speaker to give a lecture on spin orbit effects in graphene heterostructures. Thank you so much, uh, Luis, for this excellent well, lecture so and your time and efforts to give it. We really enjoyed it. And I hope uh, we will have some uh, personal you know, interactions. Did you see my screen, by the way? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, because I, I, I'm not able to realize that. Fine, so it's all good. So next week, uh, friends, uh, we will have two talks, one on Monday, uh, 3 p.m. and Thursday, 5 p.m. by Professor Albert Ford. I again invite all of you to kindly join. And I hope, Luis, uh, you can also join next week. Uh, or weeks after, uh, we will have very good talks also in next weeks. So thank you so much and please stay safe. See so you next week. My, my talk is at uh, what time next week? Uh, next your Monday. talk will be uh, 5 p.m. Indian time. That would be 1.30 p.m. Uh, France time. Thank you. Okay, I will remind you one day before. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye, Albert. Bye, Louis, and bye, friends. Thank you very much. Yes. And apologies for the internet. Ah, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.